What lies on the other end of our eventual end? There's really only two things assured in life, according to Benjamin Franklin, which is going to be death and taxes. And, I mean, there's really no way that we're escaping our end because, you know, due to the laws of entropy, we're just going to kind of fade away. With taxes, we just pay to an insatiable giant thing that doesn't appear to actually do anything with them. But I could probably go on, like, tangents for years about that, so moving on. <laughs> but due to the fact that our metabolisms break down over time and genetic damage is just going to build up over time, eventually our cells will stop functioning as they reach kind of an end point where there's so much genetic damage that the cell will either undergo apoptosis, become cancerous, or just in general, uh, stops functioning properly. And to that ultimate end, eventually our bodies will just stop functioning correctly, which I believe happens at about like 25 years old, is specifically when you start kind of like aging. And me being 31 now, well, I'm running out of time. <laughs> so I'm already aging, I've been aging for six years. So the whole point though is, is that as this happens, it will happen. You're going to meet your end, which is a really depressing way to start this video. So we're just gonna move on. But there is kind of a concept that it might not be as bad as you might think. So it's sort of like putting a youngling down for a nap, right? They kind of freak out about it. Well, if they don't freak out about it and they just kind of go to sleep, they'll wake up and realize it wasn't that bad. Same concept could maybe be applied to our own ends. We just simply don't understand it and that's why we are afraid of it. It may be possible that something else that's way better is on the other end of this thing, or maybe all of our like absolute fears about this could be confirmed. But the point is, is that whether you believe in anything or not on the other side, it's really kind of a personal choice. Me personally, stay repping the big man upstairs. But even with this knowledge or lack of knowledge, questions will always continue to mount as far as what happens after the end is reached, I suppose. And with that, even more questions begin piling up about what humans actually are. Reductive physicalism is something that is known to basically be the fact that if you look out and you see anything, this is the only plane that we are on. And by the way, we're going to get way out here with this. We will be getting to Henry, so just give me a second. But basically, with reductive physicalism, we there's nothing above us, there's nothing below us, there's no spiritual plane, there's nothing. It's just this one, the universe as is, and everything physical in it is kind of how it works. So once you're done being a physical entity of a human or an animal and that falls apart due to entropy, that's it. There's nothing else left. Which arguably is very depressing. <laughs> to me personally, that kind of just makes it seem like chaos is just here for chaos's sake and there's really no point to anything. And with that, to be brought into life is really just more of a punishment than an actual benefit. Some people are like, oh, well, you get to enjoy life for 80 years. But if you actually look at, like, the expansiveness of the universe time-wise, this is a hilariously short blip of time. The other belief, essentially, is known as non-physicalism. So, I know that one. You guys know, you guys already know that one. So, basically, with non-physicalism, that means that there is a spiritual plane out there that you will eventually go to, whether that is uh, God or just the spirit in general not really known basically you have a soul and it's woven into your body and all throughout and you're intricately connected to everything so this would almost be like the same concept as if you take dark energy for instance uh, physicalism right now as far as we know it doesn't really account for things like dark energy which also dark matter we don't really even know what is essentially moving most of the galaxies in the universe we're getting way out here with this but the point is, is that with non-physicalism, you have a soul, it's in your body. The way I view it is you can believe there's nothing after life, or you can believe there's something is after life. Either way, only one of those things is depressing. So if you believe the first one, hey, you're a stronger man than me. But regardless of whether you think something is or is not waiting for us, ultimately each one of us is going to have to find out at some point in time. Whether that be by the hands of another human, natural causes like some sort of disease, an animal, or just cruel twist of fate early in life. Nobody really knows what's going to happen to them, but we all have to figure it out at some point. Sort of like an ironclad contract signed at birth that this is it. <laughs> Good luck to you. But what's been called into question as of late is how does this process actually happen? Enter the story of Henry Languille a murderer back in the 1900s, like really early 1900s in France, who was sentenced to his end for his crimes of ending others. 
A doctor would actually watch the process after making this request of him so that he could understand at what point do humans actually check out of the mortal coil. Because here's the thing, for a very long time people assumed that the guillotine was the ultimate and it was essentially a gentle solution for an issue of getting rid of people. Turns out it might not have been so gentle and it may have actually caused like a lot of undue stress on people that eventually would come out due to this specific event. So in today's episode, let's discuss how Henry Laguil was able to stay alive for just a little bit longer, at least about 30 seconds or so, after meeting with the guillotine and what the doctor would note as a little alarming. And we're probably going to get a little more heavily into the neurology and actual biology of this, simply because it's important, I think, to do so. And also because I enjoy talking about all of physical biology, so here we are. I mean, hopefully since you're here, you like this too, and it honestly is true horror, because this would be the worst thing I think that could happen to somebody. But before we do that, I do want to say thank you guys for your continued support on this channel. Because of that, you may have noticed the camera work got at least a little better, hopefully you noticed that. Anyways, if you didn't notice it, I still need to mess with some settings. But basically, I was able to do this and also hook up my mic appropriately so that everything kind of works out better and it's not ear grinding nonsense. Also, the deal still stands for uh, the Michigan Dogman. If we can get this channel up to a million subs, I think it was, by 2027 in June, I will go up there and look for the Michigan Dogman. I'm also thinking about doing something with Mount Shasta, of going out there with my Forerunner and just kind of like looking around for cave systems. That did not go well for one guy, if I remember, in the desert. I don't remember what his name was, so hopefully that doesn't happen to me, but if I stop uploading on both channels, <laughs> I think you know what happened. So are you the sum of your parts or are you something more? A lot of people seem to not really realize that their bodies are more than just their brain and then the rest of the body. And this is actually going to include scientists and some doctors because only very recently have we started to figure out how the body is connected and in what way is everything else, like in terms of importance, going to relate to the brain. Take the spinal cord for instance. In fact, I actually mentioned this a lot on my main channel because again, it does not appear to be science-based, but Roanoke Gaming is science-based. Really just bad way to name that channel, doesn't really matter. But basically, the spinal cord is going to serve a very important purpose beyond just a bridge from the brain, with the brain being what is essentially the tyrant of the body. So the general thinking as far as past biological kind of things that I've learned and how things are starting to change as of now is that the brain would pretty much dictate to the rest of the body, okay, do this, do this, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like orchestrate behind the scenes of everything. You have essentially voluntary thought, which you can think about things and do whatever you want to do. And then you have autonomous, which is essentially running in the background, kind of keeps your heart going, uh, your breathing, which unfortunately now we're all manually breathing because we're talking about it, blinking, which we're now manually blinking, and stuff of that nature is autonomous. Your brain just runs that in the background. But with this comes an interesting idea that the brain is the most important organ in the body, according to the brain, which appears to be a little egotistical to me, but I don't make the rules because I'm just simply a brain. What I have also always found pretty fascinating towards like how this whole thing operates is if you, and this is, again, this is off track, I know, but the brain specifically, if you take that organ and you say, think about something, have a thought or want to move, there actually has to be neurons firing before you even think about it to start the process, which this always brings into question your talk, like we were talking a moment ago about how the sums of the parts of the body may not be we may not be the sum of ourself, essentially, is how does that initial thought even begin before the process is carried out? And another part with that is you can separate yourself from thinking because you know your brain has to think, and yet still, you can think outside of it. Before we go down the philosophical rabbit hole with this, because I tend to do that, uh, we'll go back to my initial example. Essentially, there was a man who was paralyzed uh, from the waist down, I believe it was upper lumbar where he was hit, so it was a complete severing of his spinal cord. They took a spinal stimulator and attached it to his spinal cord. And when doing so, they told him to think about moving his leg or moving his toe, and he actually was able to. Now this kind of brings into question, if the brain is the one organizing all the movements and all this good stuff, then how was the body able to move by just using the spine? Well, kind of throws in a whole issue, doesn't it? So neuronally speaking, which I'm pretty sure is a word, if it's not, it should be, 
the uh, actual nervous system is the spine as well. So you have the spine, you have the brain, you have the peripheral nerves, you have all of these nerves in your body which are made of the same cells as the brain. And even then you've got like the vagus nerve and everything which we'll get into here in a moment. But the point is, is that what it appears to be is that the spine itself does actually contain at least some ability to think because he was able to move because it clearly was not the brain moving the body. So because he was able to move, it may not be as cut and dry as we originally thought it to be. So when you think about it, when we do brain scans, if we say, hey, you know, can you move? Or can you think about something? Or essentially react to images, the brain itself will light up due to blood flow and electrical activity. But we really haven't looked too much at the spinal cord itself. Now there is a reason that I'm telling you all this. It's essentially for your own information, but also it does relate to this story today. But the whole point is this, is that we originally thought this is how the body works and it isn't. And the reason, again, that I'm bringing all this up is it's important to understand how the body actually operates and what makes us tick. But to sum up, this implies that the neurons inside of the spinal cord are able to think somewhat just like the brain is able to think. And I mean, really, this shouldn't even be too much of a shock because if you've ever heard about the spinal reflex, essentially, or the reflex arc of the spine, this is when you, okay, so there you are, you're having a great time, you see some fire and you think, hey, I wanna put my hand in fire. I don't know why you would do that. Maybe you thought it was a good time. So you put your hand in fire. Well, before you even feel anything, your immediate inclination is going to be to rip your hand back. The reason you do that is because as the pain nerves, or at least the body relays to the spine that, hey, we're actually like getting damaged right now, this isn't good. Your spine doesn't waste any time trying to go to the brain and saying, hey, well, we're taking damage, what should we do? And then let the brain figure it out. No, it instantly tells you to pull your hand away before you get too much damage. And then the pain sets in. This is essentially showing that to a degree, while you think you're in control of your body, the fact is, is there's built in like fail safes, I guess you could call them, that will protect you from your own choices. So other nerves that help you kind of run your body would be like the vagus nerve, which can control heart rate, talks to essentially the gut brain of the body, and actually does have its hand in things like emotional regulation. So emotional regulation, there I actually have a story that I tell. Uh, essentially, when I was in EMT school, the guy who was teaching us had his wife, there was something like an issue, and they ended up accidentally cutting her vagus nerve, and she was just never the same again. She wasn't really able to control her emotions, and it almost reminded me a little bit of Phineas Gage when he got the rod blown through his head and then it essentially separated his frontal lobe and destroyed the emotional control center of his brain. So when this happened, it wasn't a permanent thing or at least it wasn't 100% permanent. His brain was able to undergo neuroplasticity and then from there he was like, oh, okay, so he regained some emotional control. But the point is, is that while we do have the emotional control centers in the brain themselves, the vagus nerve does actually have a hand in helping us, you know, control everything. But these systems in life are there to help you in all aspects, as there's more than just nerves in the body for you to control and manipulate. The muscles, the bones, the endocrine system, the nervous system, your gut microbiome, immunological functions, all of it, is intricately woven together to work as a specialized macro system that helps you survive. Personally, I think it's a pretty crude way to look at the body as like just sort of the taxi for your brain. But then again, I also call them meat suits. So, hey. So what it begins to look like is as long as there's neuronal tissue somewhere, to a degree, that is a piece of you that we may not know at this point in time is really part of you. So the next issue is, think of a state of shock. A state of shock is when your blood pressure pretty much bottoms out, and this could be due to things like either blood loss or vasodilation all at once, which can cause your blood pressure, again, to reach such a critically low level that it has issues perfusing the brain. So your oxygen levels decrease and so do your nutrient levels, which can result in permanent damage if it's not rectified quickly. Now, one of the ways that it's kind of said that you can get around this, although I think the literature has changed on it, is that if you take somebody's legs and you place them upwards, the blood from the legs will run back down into the body, kind of increasing the blood pressure and helping the heart perfuse everything that it's going to need to perfuse. But the point is, and this is very interesting, you can't just override shock. It's sort of like being sick, right? You want to be healthy when you're sick and you want to feel better, but you can't just feel better. 
because you're having a physiological response to what's happening. The same can be said for shock. When you enter shock, you can't just override it. But it's interesting because sometimes even when you're in this shock, and this will kind of play into the chemicals that the brain releases in Henry later, some things will kind of counteract it, which, again, if you kind of think of it from the concept of are we the sum of our parts, or is there something else going on, it seems to suggest maybe there is something else going on. But the thing to note also is that without proper oxygen flow, within about one to two minutes, you will lose consciousness. Within, I believe it's like four to six minutes, you will start actually having brain damage, and within 10 minutes, you pretty much have complete brain death. But this is only at certain temperatures, because remember, you aren't really gone until you're warm and gone. If you're cold, you might still be able to be brought back. In fact, there was a pre-adult, I believe, back in just a couple of years ago, who ended up falling into an icy lake, and they found him like 15 minutes later, and they were able to revive him because he was cold, and it slows down the metabolism of cells, basically causing not as many oxidative chemical reactions to pop up. I think that's the best way to say it, and not destroying the cell. But once this happens, that you've already reached the 10 minute mark, it's very unlikely that you will recover, and this results in a traumatic brain injury, which I will say there's a caveat to that, and that is that the brain can in some ways recover. In fact, there has been spontaneous recovery of traumatic brain injuries with people just waking up. There was actually, it was a really sad uh, example. A guy, he was a stuntman, I believe, and he ended up injuring himself to the point that he just went into a coma, wouldn't wake up, like TBI, everything. So eventually he did recover. It was like 10, 15 years later or something like that. And after he recovered, he would basically ask his family, like, how long was I out for? And they told him, like, you were out for this long, which would be devastating news, obviously, because that's a good chunk of your life. Now, the family would stay with him to try to keep an eye on him because he would have night terrors. But as time went on, they would get tired. So eventually, I believe it was the father who was going to stay that night, but instead fell asleep or went home. And essentially, after that, he had night terrors, jumped out of bed hit his head on one of the end tables and fell on the ground where he would never recover consciousness again and then eventually he would succumb. But it's very depressing, but it shows how dynamic the brain is in its functional ability to recover from injury. Anyhow, our bodies operating to keep us alive is quite impressive when you stand back from an objective standpoint and view it. However, once it has been severed from the brain, that consciousness is in no way assured However, it would appear that it still does kind of run in the background, maybe at a decreased capacity. Removing the brain case from the meat suit during revolutionary eras in France has been something that is just long running as they really do seem to appreciate their guillotines. The process was assumed to be quick, efficient, and one of the more humane ways of getting rid of people. When that blade falls, it will typically crack through the cervical vertebrae, and depending on how long your neck is, or if your shoulders are really pressed against the wood, the whole point was it was supposed to knock you out quickly so that you didn't have to suffer. But when it happens, is the observer, or not the observer, but is the experiencer actually done? It would appear as though no. Just because you gave your neck some fresh air doesn't mean instantly it's lights out, as it was observed in a man named Henry Languil, a murderer sentenced to the guillotine for his crimes, and a doctor having observed this exact consciousness maintaining in his head. So he approached him and asked him prior to the actual process, hey, when you go up there, when you, you know, get your head taken care of, I want you to try to blink to me while it happens so that I know you're still conscious and you're still in there. But what the doctor would note was fairly disturbing. I consider it essential for you to know that Langwill displayed an extraordinary sang Freud and even courage from the moment when he was told that his last hour had come until the moment that he walked firmly to the scaffold. It may well be, in fact, that the conditions for observation and consequently the phenomena differ greatly according to whether the condemned person retains all their sang Freud and are fully in control of themselves, or whether they're in a state of such physical and mental prostration that they have to be carried into the place of execution and are already half dead as though paralyzed by the appalling anguish of the fatal instant. 
The head fell on that severed surface of the neck and did not therefore have to take it up in my hands as the newspapers have vied with each other in repeating. I was not obliged even to touch it in order to get it upright. Chance served me well for the observation which I wished to make. Here then is what I was able to note immediately after the decapitation. The eyelids and lips of the guillotine man worked in irregularly rhythmic contractions for about five to six seconds. This phenomenon has been remarked by all those finding themselves in the same conditions as myself for observing what happens after the severing of the neck. I was dealing with undeniably living eyes which were looking at me. After several seconds, the eyelids closed again, slowly and evenly, and the head took on the same appearance as it had before I called out. It was at that point that I called out again, once more, without any spasm, slowly the eyelids lifted, and undeniably, living eyes fixed themselves on mine, with perhaps even more penetration than the first time. Then there was a further closing of the eyelids, but now less complete. I tipped the effect of a third call. There was no further movement, and the eyes took on a glazed look, which they have of the dead. I have just recounted to you with rigorous exactness of what I was able to observe. The whole thing had lasted 25 to 30 seconds. So this may not sound like much, but the reality of this situation is you would be going into immediate shock, but it would still be an absolute nightmare. Again, depending on where the blade fell due to the length of the neck, if it hit a bit further down the spine, or possibly even higher up, it would have tremendously different results. Hitting lower on the spine means that the brainstem would be spared, which the brainstem actually being damaged has been known to knock people completely out, and that's just done. But if the brainstem was hit, then it wouldn't be that much of an issue. He should have been gone. So it sounds like it hit a little lower. The spasmodic events clearly showed that the nerves, when they were severed, would have caused an almost probably seizure-like level of neurons firing, as that would be a complete shock to the system. The neurons would have been well oxygenated because typically during a response such as walking up to a guillotine, you're going to be having adrenaline pumping through your body, you're going to be breathing heavy, you're going to essentially be oxygenating all of those tissues because you're getting ready to either fight or run, but you really don't have a chance to. So because of this, the brain could carry on its metabolic processes for at least a little while, even after the hit had already fell. But what happens when those nerves get severed? Well, it's kind of a thing that we don't really necessarily know, but if we take into consideration what the brain does to try to cope with, say, like tinnitus, which I have, which is a blast, Essentially, you have hair cells in your ear. When those get damaged, those no longer report back to the brain what they're hearing. So rather than do the smart thing, your brain you know, just decides that, hey, okay, well, because this isn't reporting back to me, I guess it's just making a really loud E noise. So that's kind of where tinnitus comes from. Your temporal lobe is the culprit as to why you're hearing that if you do have it. In fact, there was one guy who thought, they thought back in the day, it was the auditory nerve because of the damage to the hair cells, when in reality it's a temporal lobe. So what happened was he got his auditory nerve cut, when he woke up from the surgery, realized he couldn't hear anything, which was the plan, but he could still hear his tinnitus. So essentially, with all of those nerves in the neck severed, it's very probable that the brain would be interpreting the lack of information as essentially like a tinnitus boom, where the brain would be in an absolute panic because it can no longer communicate to the rest of the body. So if we actually kind of go off what happens to people when they're paralyzed, it might be a similar process. Typically people will feel like a chronic pain in their nerves. Sometimes they can kind of feel their body, but not really, they'll feel pressure. So the brain is reporting, or at least through accessory nerves, through other areas, there is somewhat of a sensation, but there are many issues that are associated with the actual severing of a spine. For instance, like a lot of people don't know this, but in systems that are below the damage, they will try to report to the brain that there is an issue, right? But they can't, or they, it can't get past the damage of the spinal cord. So it'll start doing secondary things like changing your mood, raising your blood pressure, which it can raise blood pressure to the point of a stroke. It will also do things like give you goosebumps. Uh, there'll be phantom pains. It'll essentially be trying to alert the body that something's wrong. In fact, there was a woman that I was, when I was researching this, it's called dyserphalexia. Her bladder had an issue and her body was trying to alert her to it. And she ended up almost having a stroke because it just could not, or she could not figure out what was happening. With Henry specifically, it's clear that his brain would be randomly firing in an attempt to communicate again with the rest of his body, which will sound 
kind of like noise in your own head. This means that his thoughts would have been disjointed and dysregulated, which would have made it really difficult, but it seems he was still able to react to the stimulus of hearing his name called. But by locking eyes with the doctor, even in a state of shock, it does show that there was still at least enough consciousness left to recognize the situation, which again, total nightmare. But you know, one of the things that's interesting that we know now that we didn't know then is that it's actually kind of standard for your brain to continue on for a little while, even after your heart stops. So there are technically two deaths, I guess you could call them. Technically four, if you really want to get it. Well, I guess it would be three, but the other one's more philosophical. The first one is, I believe it is medical death, or basically when your heart stops. And what's interesting is when people's heart stops, they get an impending sense of doom, which makes total sense because if that goes out, well, you're kind of screwed. There's a medication actually that's given to people when they need to stop the heart and the people are conscious during it because it's only supposed to work for a little bit. The overwhelming sense of dread that these people have during that process is well founded, but it's also very chemical because the brain would know the heart's no longer beating. But the other one is true death, which is when your brain officially dies. And then the third one is when, you know, after you're already gone, when people stop talking about you and it's like you never existed. And that's why I put out these videos. Maybe I'll be remembered, probably not now. <laughs> but what is interesting about these types of, I guess, true death is just prior to true death there is a chemical that joe rogan talks about a lot that actually is released in the brain just moments before you flatline out and your brain is done and this is called dimethyltryptamine or dmt now again this is something that i find very very interesting because in biology typically traits that are passed down serve some purpose to keep you alive right uh, reproducing let your genetics go on uh, more muscle allows you to fight other things to survive. Uh, faster metabolism allows you to run and keep up with other animals to eat. Most things that we know of are able to be passed down to other people because they serve some purpose to keep the original progenitor alive, right? The DMT release is very interesting because it essentially serves as a point to kind of calm you at the very end. Why do you need to be calmed at the very end if it doesn't really serve any purpose because you're going to go anyways? I mean, your body could leave you in a state of complete panic and it wouldn't matter because you would still meet that end regardless. So I find that type of thing kind of, to me personally, it seems sort of like it's on there or it's in there on purpose as opposed to just a random happenstance. But that is a discussion for another video. And I don't really know if that would be a true horror or not. So it's very likely that after the first few seconds of shock, the DMT would then enter the brain, which may be serving as sort of a counter to kind of calm his brain, even though he is in shock, and allow him at that point, it's sort of a perfect storm of allowing him to consciously come back for a moment to look at the doctor and then blink his eyes twice to let him know that he's still in there. Although within 30 seconds, you have to remember, there is a fresh wound on the neck and the carotid and jugular are both severed on both sides, which means you're probably gonna bleed out exceedingly fast. Not probably, you will. And within 30 seconds, there would be no blood left in the brain and all of the neur neurons would essentially be running out of oxygen and going into panic mode and then shutting down. But the information gained from this was the earliest form of confirmed brain activity after an event that was designed to take you out instantly. And this began a call for basically it to be abolished because this was no longer viewed as more humane than any other way because those people were definitely still awake. Initially, the actual time of death was when your heart stopped. So, you know, removing the two components from each other meant that it was done. But by separating your heart from your brain, it didn't really have the intended effect that they thought it should. So this was no longer considered a clean method of getting rid of people. And this would show that the human body was much more complex than they initially thought, and possibly even more resilient. So while the argument of whether or not we had a soul was still on the table, the idea of instantaneous death uh, due to the head being disconnected from the rest of the body was something that was just no longer going to be assumed to be the case. And eventually, based on observations made in cases like this and in other cases where the same exact thing was noted, eventually the guillotine would be just completely abandoned because it's seen as kind of a nightmare way to go. Thus, this was 
termed a cruel method and no longer a gentle method of taking someone out because they could still feel the pain and this would lead to other issues which is like punishment on top of punishment. They weren't there to destroy and make you just suffer in pain, they were there to get rid of you. And though some people would like to bring it back, I'm pretty sure, especially nowadays, this concludes the story of Henry Languil. He may have been a driving force behind the abolishment of essentially the execution method that took him out. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoy, then leaving a like helps get this video out here. I hope it wasn't like all over the place in this one. I'm still figuring out how to look at the camera and also look at what I've written, so I end up ad-libbing like a lot of this. I'm not sure if it sounds bad or if it sounds okay. Let me know down in the comments what you think. I think I'm gonna need to get a teleprompter at some point. We'll see how that goes. I don't really know if that's gonna work, but they're like a thousand bucks. It's ridiculous. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's not your problem. So if you enjoyed, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, leave me a like. It, that would be fantastic because it gets into the algorithm. If you hated it, leave a dislike as it's, uh, you know, actual engagement. If you really like the content and you want to keep up with this channel, uh, subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. And I'll be doing more things like this in the future, as well as I think I'm going to cover like a Wendigo next because we got to get back to some cryptids. I haven't done those in a while. But anyhow, thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next one.